Hi, and welcome to this evening's Theatricos Theater Company presentation of Stories of the Season. <clears throat> I'm Tony Cetera, and I'll be your host this evening. Tonight's story is Little Gretchen and the Wooden Shoe, written by Elizabeth Harrison from her 1902 publication, Christmas Tide. And you are in luck. Our reader tonight is Dermot Luchart. Theatricos Theater Company has been performing in Flagstaff for almost 50 years, and we plan to be here for another 50. We've been busy during the 2020, even, even though the pandemic restricted our ability to gather in person. We've renovated the theater, created numerous performances online, and we're launching a citywide arts podcast live streaming show. Uh, we've also had great success during the pandemic by raising over $80,000 with our goal of raising 100,000 to offset our losses this year. No surprise, you can make the difference. Membership start at $50, but please make your donation of any size by going to theatricos.com slash donate. Oh, we have a 2021 season of shows carefully curated to be done during the pandemic. And as we work our way out of this at home, stay at home mandates, we're, we're tackling our tumultuous world head on. Season tickets for the new season have been available since December 6th and just in time for your holiday gift giving. Speaking of holidays, it's time now to sit back and watch Dermot read Gretchen and the Wooden Shoe, our newest online production of Stories for the Season. Hi, Dermot. How's it going, Tony? Doing good. You ready to go? I am. You got your whole family ready for uh, the holidays? Yeah, we're getting close. Uh, we've got a couple last minute wrapping and things to do, but other than that, I think we're getting close. Uh, sounds fantastic. Well, I'll let you go. Do your stuff, Dermot. Thank you very much. All right, so this is the story of little Gretchen and the wooden shoe. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, far away across the great ocean in a country called Germany, there could be seen a small log hut on the edge of a great forest whose fir trees extended for miles and miles to the north. This little house, made of heavy hewn logs, had but one room in it. A rough pine door gave entrance to this room and a small square window admitted the light. At the back of the house was built an old fashioned stone chimney out of which in winter usually curled a thin blue smoke because there was not very much fire within. Small as the house was, it was large enough for the two people who lived in it. And today I'd like to tell you a story about those two people. One was an old gray haired woman, so old that the little children of the village nearly half a mile away often wondered whether she had come into the world with the huge mountains and the great fir trees which stood at the back of her small hut like giants. Her face was wrinkled all over with deep lines, which if the children could only have read them would have told them of many years of cheerful, happy self-sacrifice, of loving, anxious watching behind, beside sick beds, of quiet endurance of pain, many a day of hunger and cold, and of a thousand deeds of unselfish love for other people. But, of course, they couldn't read this strange handwriting. They only knew that she was old and wrinkled, and that she stooped as she walked. None of them seemed to fear her, for her smile was always cheerful, and she had a kindly word for each of them if they chanced to meet her on her way to and from the village. With this old, old woman lived a very small girl, so bright and happy was she that the travelers who passed by the lonesome little house on the edge of the forest often thought a sunbeam as they saw her. These two people were known in the village as Granny Goodyear and Little Gretchen. The winter had come and gone, and the forest had snapped off many of the smaller branches from the pine trees in the forest. Gretchen and her granny were up by daybreak each morning. After their simple breakfast of oatmeal, Gretchen would run to the little closet and fetch Granny's old woolen shawl, which seemed almost as old as Granny herself. Gretchen always claimed the right to put the shawl over her Granny's head, even though she had to climb onto the wooden bench to do it. After carefully pinning it under Granny's chin, she gave her a goodbye kiss, and Granny started out for her morning's work in the forest. 
This work was nothing more and nothing less than the gathering up of the twigs and branches which the autumn winds and winter frosts had thrown upon the ground. These were carefully gathered into a large bundle which Granny tied together with a strong linen band. She then managed to lift the bundle to her shoulder and trudged off to the village with it. Here, she sold the kindling wood to the people of the village. Sometimes she would get only a few pence a day and sometimes a dozen or more, but on this money, little Gretchen and she managed to survive. They had their home and the forest kindly furnished the wood for the fire which kept them warm in the cold winter. In the summertime, Granny had a little garden at the back of the hut where she raised with little Gretchen's help a few potatoes and turnips and onions. These she carefully stored away for winter use. To this meager supply, the pennies gained by selling the twigs from the forest added the oatmeal for Gretchen and a little black coffee for Granny. Meat was a thing that they never thought of having. It cost too much money. Still, Granny and Gretchen were very happy because they loved each other dearly. Sometimes Gretchen would be left alone all day long in the hut because Granny would have some work to do in the village after selling her bundle of sticks and twigs. It was during these long days that little Gretchen had taught herself to sing the song which the wind sang to the pine branches. In the summertime, she learned the chirp and twitter of the birds until her voice might almost be mistaken for a bird's voice. She learned to dance as the swaying shadows did and even to talk to the stars which shone through the little square window when Granny came home too late or too tired to talk. Sometimes when the weather was fine or her Granny had an extra bundle of newly knitted stockings to take to the village, she would let little Gretchen go along with her. It chanced that one of these trips to the town came just the week before Christmas and Gretchen's eyes were delighted by the sight of the lovely Christmas trees which stood in the window of the village store. It seemed to her that she would never tire of looking at the knit dolls and the woolen lambs and the little wooden shops with their small painted men and women in them and all the other fine things. She had never owned a plaything in her entire life and therefore toys which you and I might not think much of seemed to her to be very beautiful. That night, after their supper of baked potatoes was over, and little Gretchen had cleared away the dishes and swept up the hearth. Because Granny Deer was so tired, she brought her own small wooden stool and placed it very near Granny's feet and sat down upon it, folding her hands on her lap. Granny knew that this meant she wanted to talk about something, so she smilingly laid away the large Bible which she had been reading and took up her knitting, which was as much as to say, well, Gretchen dear, Granny is ready to listen. Granny, said Gretchen slowly, it's almost Christmas time, isn't it? Yes, dearie, said Granny. Only five more days now. And then she sighed. Little Gretchen was so happy that she did not notice Granny's sigh. What do you think, Granny, that I'll get this Christmas? Said she, looking up eagerly into Granny's face. Oh, child, child, said Granny, shaking her head. I'm afraid we'll have no Christmas this year. We're too poor for that. Oh, but Granny, interrupted little Gretchen, think of all the beautiful toys we saw in the village today. Uh, surely Santa Claus has sent enough for every little child. Oh, dearie, said Granny, but those toys are for people who can pay money for them. And we have no money to spend for Christmas toys. Well, Granny, said Gretchen, uh, perhaps some of the little children who live in the great house on that hill uh, at the other end of the village would be willing to share some of their toys with me. They'd be so glad to give some to a little girl who has none. Oh, dear child, said Granny, leaning forward and stroking the soft, shiny hair of the little girl. Your heart is full of love. You would be glad to bring a Christmas to every child. But their heads are so full of what they are going to get that they forget about anyone but themselves. Then she sighed and she shook her head. Well, Granny, uh, said Gretchen, her bright, happy tone of voice growing a little less joyous, uh, per perhaps Santa Claus will show some of the village children how to make presents that do not cost money. And some of them may, may surprise me Christmas morning with a present. And, and Granny, added she, springing up from the low stool, uh, can't, can't I gather some of the pine branches and take them to the old sick man who lives in the house by the mill so that he can have the sweet smell of our pine forest in, him, in his room all Christmas day? Yes, dearie, said Granny. You may do what you can to make the Christmas bright and happy, but you must not expect any presents yourself. Oh, but Granny, said little Gretchen, her face brightening, you, you forget all about the shining Christmas angels who came down to earth and sang their wonderful song the night the beautiful Christ child was born. 
They are so loving and good that they will not forget any little child. I shall ask my dear stars tonight to tell them of us. You know, she added with a look of relief, the stars are so very high that they must know the angels quite well as they come and go with their messages from God. Granny sighed as she half whispered, poor child, poor child. But Gretchen threw her arm around Granny's neck and gave her a hearty kiss, saying as she did so, oh, Granny, you don't talk to the stars often enough, else you wouldn't be so sad at Christmas time. Then she danced all around the room, whirling her little skirts about her to show Granny how the wind had made the snow dance that day. She looked so happy that Granny forgot her cares and worries and laughed with little Gretchen over her new snow dance. The days passed on, and the morning before Christmas Eve came. Gretchen, having tidied up the little room, for Granny had taught her to be a careful little housekeeper, was off to the forest, singing a bird-like song, almost as happy and free as the birds themselves. She was very busy that day, preparing a surprise for Granny. First, however, she gathered the most beautiful of the fir branches within her reach to take the next morning to the old sick man who lived by the mill. The day was all too short for the happy little girl. When Granny came trudging wearily home that night, she found the frame of the doorway covered with green pine branches. It's to welcome you, Granny, it's to welcome you, cried Gretchen. Our old dear home wanted to give you a Christmas welcome. Don't you see the branches of evergreen make it look like it's smiling all over? as trying to say happy Christmas to you, Granny. And Granny laughed and kissed the little girl as they opened the door and went in together. And here was another surprise for Granny. The four posts of the wooden bed, which stood in one corner of the room, had been trimmed by the busy little fingers with smaller and more flexible branches of the pine trees. A small bouquet of red mountain ash berries uh, stood at each side of the fireplace. And these, together with the trimmed posts of the bed, gave the plain old room quite a festive look. Gretchen laughed and clapped her hands and danced about until the house seemed full of music to the poor tired granny, whose heart had been sad as she turned toward their home last night, that night, thinking of the disappointment which must come to loving little Gretchen the next morning. After supper was over, little Gretchen drew her stool up to granny's side and laying her soft little hands on granny's knee, asked to be told once again the story of the coming of the Christ child, how the night that he was born the beautiful angels had sung their wonderful song, and how the whole sky had become bright with a strange and glorious light never seen by the people of earth before. Gretchen had heard the story many, many times before, but she never grew tired of it. And now that Christmas Eve had come again, the happy little child wanted to hear it once more. When Granny had finished telling it, the two sat quiet and silent for a little while, thinking it over. Then Granny rose and said that it was time for them to go to bed. She slowly took off her heavy wooden shoes, such as are worn in that country, and placed them beside the hearth. Gretchen looked thoughtfully at them for a minute or two, and then she said, Granny, don't you think that somebody in all this wide world will think of us tonight? No, Gretchen, said Granny. I don't think anyone will. Well, Granny, said Gretchen, the Christmas angels will, I know. Uh, so I'm going to take one of your wooden shoes, and I'm going to put it on the windowsill outside so that they can see it as they pass by. I'm sure the stars will tell the Christmas angels where the shoe is. Oh, child, said Granny, you're only getting ready for a disappointment tomorrow morning. There will be nothing whatsoever in the shoe. I can tell you that now. But little Gretchen would not listen. She only shook her head and cried out, Oh, Granny, you don't talk enough to the stars. With this, she seized the shoe and opening the door, hurried it out to place it on the window windowsill. It was very dark outside and something soft and cold seemed to gently kiss her hair and face. Gretchen knew by this that it was snowing, and she looked up to the sky, anxious to see if the stars were in sight, but a strong wind was tumbling the dark, heavy snow clouds about and had shut away all else. Never mind, said Gretchen softly to herself. The stars are up there, even if I can't see them, and the Christmas angels do not mind snowstorms. Just then, a rough wind went sweeping by the little girl, whispering something to her which she could not understand, and then it made a sudden rush up to the snow clouds and parted them so that the deep, mysterious sky appeared beyond, and shining down out of the midst of it was Gretchen's favorite star. Oh, little star, little star, said the child, laughing aloud. I knew you were there, though I couldn't see you. Will you whisper to the Christmas angels as they come by that little Gretchen wants so very much to have her Christmas gift tomorrow morning, if they have one to spare, and that she has put one of Granny's shoes upon the windowsill ready for it? A moment more, and the little girl, standing on tiptoe, had reached the windowsill and placed the shoe upon it and was back again in the house beside Granny in the warm fire. The two went quietly to bed. And that night, as little 
Gretchen knelt to pray to the Heavenly Father. In a few moments, she was quietly sleeping, dreaming of the Christmas angels. The next morning, very early, even before the sun was up, little Gretchen was awakened by the sound of sweet music coming from the village. She listened for a moment, and then she knew that the choir boys were singing the Christmas carols in the open air of the village street. She sprang up out of bed and began to dress herself as quickly as possible, singing as she dressed. While Granny was slowly putting on her clothes, little Gretchen, having finished dressing herself, unfastened the door and hurried out to see what the Christmas angels had left in the old wooden shoe. The white snow covered everything. Trees, stumps, roads, and pastures, until the whole world looked like fairyland. Gretchen climbed up on a large stone which was beneath the window and carefully lifted down the wooden shoe. The snow tumbled off of it in a shower over the little girl's hands, but she did not care. She ran hurriedly back into the house, putting her hand into the toe of the shoe as she ran. Oh, Granny, oh, Granny, she exclaimed. You didn't believe the Christmas angels would think about us, but see, they have, they have. Look, here's a dear little bird nestled down in the toe of your shoe. Oh, isn't he beautiful? Granny came forward and looked at what the child was holding lovingly in her hand. And there she saw a tiny chickadee whose wing was evidently broken by the rough and boisterous winds of the night before, and who had taken shelter in the safe, dry toe of the old wooden shoe. She gently took the bird out of Gretchen's hands and skillfully bound his broken wing to his side so that he need not hurt himself by trying to fly with it. Then she showed Gretchen how to make a nice warm nest for the little stranger close by the fire. And when their breakfast was ready, she let Gretchen feed the little bird with a few moist crumbs. Later in the day, Gretchen carried the fresh green bows to the old sick man by the mill. And on her way home, she stopped to see and enjoy the Christmas toys of some other children whom she knew, never once wishing that they were hers. When she reached home, she found that the little bird had gone to sleep. Soon, however, he opened his eyes and stretched his head up, giving her an expression that said just as plain as a bird could say, now I need something more to eat. And Gretchen gladly fed him again. And then holding him in her lap, she softly and gently stroked his gray feathers until the little creature seemed to lose all fear of her. That evening, Granny taught her a Christmas hymn and told her another beautiful Christmas story. Then Gretchen made up a funny little story to tell to the birdie. He winked his eyes and turned his head from side to side in such a silly fashion that Gretchen laughed until tears came. As Granny and her got ready for bed that night, Gretchen put her arms softly around Granny's neck and whispered, what a beautiful Christmas we had today, Granny. Is there anything in the world more lovely than Christmas? Nay, child, nay, said Granny. Not to such loving hearts as yours. The end. Fantastic. Thank you, Dermot. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for joining us, joining us. And uh, we hope you enjoyed this wonderful story from Dermot. Uh, please consider donating to Theatricos this month to help us reach our fundraising goal for 2020. Uh, you can make a one-time donation or set up a monthly withdrawal or um, make any kind of payment that you choose to. We can uh, find out more information if you go to theatricos.com slash donate. And please join us again tomorrow for the next performance of Stories of the Season, which happens to be the classic, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus, read by um, me. Well, thank you. Enjoy your holiday. And to all the Lichards, happy holidays. Stay happy healthy. Holidays. Stay. And good night to all. Indeed. Happy holidays, everybody.